The Kaaba in Mecca, Islam's holiest site, has become the stage for a mysterious occurrence, a sign that echoes biblical prophecies of the imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this profound exploration, we are confronted with an extraordinary manifestation of mystical signs at the Kaaba in Mecca. Recent events, marked by colossal hailstorms, sudden snowfall, and invasive locust swarms, have stirred the hearts of believers worldwide. As we delve into the spiritual significance of these mysterious occurrences, we are reminded of the urgency to heed the signs of the times and prepare our hearts for the glorious coming of Christ. Join us on this enlightening journey as we decipher the profound message embedded within these supernatural events and draw closer to the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Let us eagerly anticipate the triumphant return of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and be steadfast in our faith as we await His imminent arrival. When you witness a hailstorm, what crosses your mind? Do you ponder the presence of God? Indeed, the Lord reveals Himself through elements akin to a powerful hailstorm, a relentless wind, and torrents of rain. He casts His might upon the earth, unmistakably asserting His authority. Many perceive such calamities not solely as natural occurrences, but as spiritual messages. They signify God's voice, heralding either His imminent return or the culmination of the age. When nature unleashes its fury upon the world, it serves as a stark reminder of the Earth's universal accountability, not merely to divine retribution against individuals, but to a broader judgment. Consider the recent tumults, such as hailstorms and snowstorms striking even the sacred grounds of Mecca. While science offers explanations for these events, let us not overlook their spiritual significance, as outlined in the scriptures. What divine communique might be encrypted within these occurrences? particularly directed toward Mecca. In recent times, Mecca, the revered city of Islam, has been besieged by a succession of profound disasters. Such occurrences, unprecedented in their severity, have gripped the hearts of many. Never before have the streets of Mecca witnessed such a fierce onslaught of calamities. The heavens have opened, releasing hailstones of unprecedented size upon this sacred land. Moreover, History was made as the Kaaba and its pilgrims beheld the rare spectacle of snowfall gracing these hallowed grounds. These events have left the Muslim community bewildered, prompting both scientific inquiry and spiritual contemplation. They mark a convergence of the natural world and divine providence, igniting discussions on the significance of these phenomena. Yet amidst the debate, the faithful are drawn to divine perspectives, seeking to discern whether these occurrences are mere coincidences or messages from the Almighty. Such uncertainties have propelled many to seek solace and understanding in the teachings of the Bible. As hearts yearn for clarity, earnest seekers delve into the sacred scriptures, searching for enlightenment and the ultimate resolution to this profound question. Is this a manifestation of God's judgment? Hail has long been regarded as a divine tool for punishing the unrighteous and showcasing God's mighty power. The original author aptly acknowledges hail as a symbol of God's wrath in the Bible. We find numerous references to hail, notably in the account of the ten plagues inflicted upon Egypt. This event is chronicled in both Exodus and the Psalms, emphasizing the severity of God's judgment upon those who sin. The Egyptians incurred this wrath due to their mistreatment and oppression of the Israelites, serving as a cautionary tale for all who defy God's will. Throughout biblical history, Hail has been employed as a weapon against various adversaries of God's people, signaling divine retribution against those who oppose His plans. However, amid these displays of wrath, the Bible also portrays hail as a symbol of God's ultimate victory and His majestic glory, as seen in Revelation and the Psalms. In the case of the ten plagues, including the devastating hailstorm, God's purpose was clear, to compel Pharaoh to release the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. Let us not forget the severity of the seventh plague, forewarned by God Himself. Tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded until now. The hail descended upon all those exposed in the fields, humans and animals alike, and claimed their lives. The plague of hail struck the Egyptian people with unprecedented force. Described in the scriptures as colossal balls of ice, it spared no living creature. Some sought refuge indoors, but those who remained outside faced immediate death. Remarkably, this plague seemed to penetrate Pharaoh's heart, prompting him to summon Moses and acknowledge his wrongdoing once more. He even promised to release God's people if the plague ceased. 
Though God halted the hail, Pharaoh reneged on his word, refusing to set the Israelites free. This devastating hailstorm, a localized event typical of such plagues, wreaked havoc exclusively upon the Egyptians, sparing the children of Israel dwelling in Goshen. Its ferocity was unparalleled, a cataclysmic event not witnessed in Egypt's history. Now, let's reflect on snow. What comes to mind when you see snowfall? In the divine narrative of the scriptures, snow emerges as a profound symbol of God's grace. It is not merely a meteorological phenomenon, but a visual sermon of the heavens. Consider Isaiah 1.18, where the Lord extends an invitation to reason together, promising that though our sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. This imagery is not accidental. It is a deliberate portrait of transformation, a testament to the boundless grace that God offers. From Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God weaves snow into its narrative tapestry, each mention rich with symbolism. Snow in the Bible is a metaphor for purity, grace, and a fresh beginning, echoing the Lord's abundant provision, His protective embrace, His righteous judgment, His awe-inspiring might, and His intricate creation. It signifies the transformative essence of divine love, offering us the chance to be reborn, our slates wiped clean. Grace, like snow, falls softly upon us, covering the blemishes of our sin and creating a landscape of purity. It speaks of a Creator who is not only capable of erasing our transgressions, but eager to do so. The grace of God is not passive. It is as active as the snowflakes that dance upon the wind, each one a unique promise of renewal. In the biblical context, snow is a canvas upon which God paints the story of redemption. It blankets the earth in a pure, unbroken expanse, just as grace covers our lives, offering a fresh start. The snow-laden ground reflects the sun's light, dazzling and bright. Much like grace reflects the righteousness of God, making us radiant in His sight. Moreover, snow underscores the Lord's dominion over all creation, reinforcing the grandeur and might inherent in the world around us, a testament to the marvels crafted by His hands. In moments of trial and uncertainty, the gentle fall of snow whispers of the Lord's unceasing care and guidance a comforting assurance of His constant presence and sustenance. As flakes drift from the heavens, remember their divine origin. Contemplate how the Lord blankets our transgressions, those unsightly blemishes, with His purifying touch. Our sins, once stained, are now as white as snow, transformed by His grace. Behold the snow's treasures as a reflection of the Almighty, who shapes us into beings that delight Him through Christ Jesus. Our transgressions are cleansed, made pristine, and in His eyes, we are made beautiful. For even in the calamities He ordains, there lies a profound message. Swarming locusts, portents of judgment. Finally, I want to take you to a scene that you can probably only see in science fiction movies, and not an extremely sacred place, especially for Muslims. Thousands, no, perhaps hundreds of thousands of locusts invaded the Kaaba during the holy month of Ramadan. Needless to say, this at the time created debate and controversy about whether this was another one of the signs following hailstorm and snow. Throughout history, the phenomenon of plague infestations, particularly those involving locusts or grasshopper-like insects, has often been interpreted as a divine signal of judgment. This interpretation is deeply rooted in religious texts and historical accounts, most notably the biblical narratives. For instance, the plagues of Egypt, as recounted in the book of Exodus, serve as a classic example. These ten calamities were inflicted upon the Pharaoh by God, channeled through Moses, leading up to the pivotal moment of the Exodus from Egypt to Israel. The narrative in Exodus 10, 3-4 vividly describes the plague of locusts, where Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh with a message from the Lord God of the Hebrews, demanding the release of his people to serve him. The warning is stark. Should Pharaoh refuse, his territory would be overrun by locusts the following day. This biblical event is echoed in contemporary times by similar occurrences, such as the swarm of locust-like insects that recently besieged Mecca, Islam's most sacred site, drawing parallels to the prophetic signs of old. The biblical text of 2 Chronicles 7.13 further reinforces the concept of divine intervention through natural phenomena, stating that God has the power to withhold rain, unleash locusts to ravage the land, or send pestilence among his people. The recent infestation in Mecca is not an isolated incident. It recalls a similar event from a few years prior, in 2019, 
when locusts descended upon the Grand Mosque. A video dated January 14, 2019, captures the scene as a multitude of locusts swarmed the holy site. In response, authorities mobilized 138 personnel to address the infestation. This event serves as a modern-day reflection of the biblical assertion that God commands the locusts and the rain alike. The Book of Job, specifically in verses 12, 7 through 10, expands on the theme of divine sovereignty over nature. It invites reflection on the lessons that can be learned from the beasts, birds, earth, and sea creatures, all of which, according to the scripture, acknowledge the hand of the Lord in their existence. The passage emphasizes that the life of every creature and the breath of all humanity are held in God's hand. Thus, when one witnesses events such as locust infestations or other significant natural occurrences, it prompts contemplation and inquiry into the deeper significance of these events and the divine orchestration behind them. The eschatological narratives within Islamic tradition are rich with imagery and symbolism, particularly concerning the Day of Resurrection, known as Yaum al qiyamah this day is depicted as a time of profound transformation and ultimate reckoning, where the physical and spiritual realms converge in a series of extraordinary events. Among the many signs and portents associated with this day, Islamic eschatology speaks of the destruction of the Kaaba in Mecca, a site of immense religious significance. According to certain hadiths, traditions attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, the Kaaba will be dismantled stone by stone in the end times by an individual from Ethiopia, symbolizing the cessation of the pilgrimage and the nearness of the final hour. The narrative further unfolds with the release of Gog and Magog, known in Arabic as Yajuj and Majuj, who are described as tribes of chaos and corruption, held back by a mighty barrier until their predestined emergence as a sign of the approaching Day of Judgment. Their release signifies a period of widespread turmoil and devastation, a test of faith and order in the face of overwhelming disorder. In this context, Jesus, whom Muslims revere as a prophet and the Messiah, is foretold to return to earth, leading an army of righteous believers. Contrary to Christian beliefs, Islamic theology does not ascribe divinity to Jesus, but holds him in high esteem as a pivotal figure in the events leading to the Day of Resurrection. It is said that he will confront the forces of falsehood and injustice, including the enigmatic figure associated with the destruction of the Kaaba. As the Hadith describes, during this march, a divine breeze from Yemen will sweep across the land, taking the souls of the faithful, sparing them from the tribulations of the final days. This breeze is often interpreted as a merciful act from Allah, ensuring that true believers are not subjected to the harshest trials that are to come. These eschatological themes are not merely tales of destruction and despair, but are imbued with deep moral and spiritual lessons. They serve as reminders of the transient nature of worldly structures, the importance of steadfastness and faith, and the ultimate triumph of divine will. As with all eschatological beliefs, these narratives are complex and layered with meaning, offering a window into the profound sense of hope and justice that characterizes the people's view of the end times. The concept of the rapture, as depicted in Christian eschatology, is a profound and complex event that has captured the imagination and belief of many. It is described as a moment of divine intervention where the faithful are suddenly taken up into heaven, leaving behind a world to face tribulation. This event is often associated with the second coming of Christ, where it is believed that he will return to judge the living and the dead and to establish a new era of peace and righteousness. The rapture is said to occur without warning, a swift and decisive act of God that separates the righteous from the wicked. Those who are taken are spared from the subsequent period of suffering and chaos that is to engulf the world, known as the Great Tribulation. It is during this time that, according to some interpretations, those left behind will experience a moral decline, likened to the base behaviors of animals, as they grapple with the realization of their plight and the proximity of the final judgment. The imagery of the rapture shares similarities with certain Islamic eschatological beliefs, particularly in the sense of a selective salvation and the ensuing period of tribulation. While the Quran does not explicitly describe an event akin to the rapture, there are verses that resonate with the idea of God distinguishing between the faithful and the unfaithful in the end times. In the book of Revelation, chapter 9, a particularly vivid depiction of the end times is presented. It speaks of a bottomless pit from which arises a dark and smoky abyss that obscures the sun and air. 
From this pit emerge locusts with the power of scorpions, sent to torment those who do not bear the seal of God on their foreheads. This passage is often interpreted as a metaphor for the spiritual and physical afflictions that will befall those who have turned away from God's commandments. The rapture and the events described in Revelation 9 serve as stark reminders of the transient nature of earthly life and the eternal consequences of one's faith and actions. They call believers to live in a state of readiness, always prepared for the moment when they might be called to account for their lives. The parallels drawn between these biblical events and certain Islamic teachings highlight the shared themes of divine justice and the ultimate triumph of good over evil that are central to both faith traditions. The first epistle of John, specifically chapter 2, verse 22, addresses the concept of truth and deception in the context of acknowledging Jesus as the Christ. It labels as the Antichrist anyone who denies the Son and, by extension, the Father. This passage emphasizes the integral relationship between the Father and the Son in Christian theology, asserting that to deny one is to deny the other. John 14.6 further cements this relationship, with Jesus proclaiming himself as the sole pathway to the Father, embodying truth and life. The Bible's claim to authenticity is rooted in its historical precedence and the fulfillment of its prophecies. It is seen as the original sacred text, predating the Quran, and containing narratives that are later reflected in Islamic scripture. For those who place their faith in the Quran, the invitation is extended to examine the Bible, to explore its teachings, and to discern the truth within its pages. The argument posits that the Bible's prophecies, which are believed to have been fulfilled, validate its divine origin. In our walk with God, we recognize His sovereign authority and His desire for us to turn from our errors. When we look at the calamities that have befallen the Kaaba, we see a city in distress, struggling to mend and restore what was lost. Such events often lead us to ponder deeply about divine justice. In this context, some may question if these are the consequences of not heeding God's voice. Reflecting on the black stone within the Kaaba, which Jesus spoke of, we find a significant artifact. This stone, embedded in the Kaaba's eastern corner, holds historical reverence, tracing back to the dawn of humanity according to Islamic belief. It was honored even before the advent of Islam. Tradition holds that the Prophet Muhammad placed the stone in the Kaaba's wall in 605 CE, marking a pivotal moment in religious history. Over time, the stone has been fragmented, yet it remains enshrined within a silver frame, continuing to be a symbol of faith for many. The black stone's physical form resembles a fragmented dark rock, smoothed by the hands of devoted pilgrims. According to Islamic tradition, it descended from heaven as a guide for Adam and Eve, often likened to a meteorite. Engraved on the southeast wall of the Kaaba, this stone carries profound significance. Legend has it that during the construction of the Holy Kaaba, when stones were scarce, Prophet Ibrahim called upon his son Ismael to find a suitable stone to complete the sacred structure. Returning empty-handed, Ismael discovered a shiny white stone, miraculously placed in the gap he sought to fill. Ibrahim revealed that Gabriel had delivered this unique stone, completing the Kaaba's construction. In Christian prophecy, Jesus foretells the release of the evil restrained within the black stone by the false prophet, resulting in destruction for those not inscribed in the Book of Life. While the false prophet Muhammad and the beast spirit are confined within, Jesus will ultimately conquer them. Furthermore, the revelation of the man of lawlessness, currently restrained by the Holy Spirit, is imminent. Islamic prayer universally directed towards the Kaaba aligns with Jesus' warning that upon Allah's release from the Kaaba, unclean spirits and the chief demon will seize control, leading to great mourning upon Jesus' return. In Revelation 17.8, in the vision of John, the beast that once was, now is not, and yet shall ascend from the abyss to meet its end. And those who dwell upon the earth, whose names are not inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life since the world's creation, shall gaze upon the beast in wonder, for it has been, is no longer, yet will come again. This beast signifies a dominion of political might, upon which the harlot named Babylon is perched. It reveals that in the final days, this ecclesiastical entity shall exert sway over the kings of the globe. Verily, the prophecy foretells a time when earthly sovereignties shall join hands with the false church of Babylon. The revelation itself cautions against altering the divine message it contains. The words of this revelation, bestowed by the Messiah, are sacred, 
To meddle with these prophetic declarations invites grave repercussions. Those who dare to augment the words of this prophecy shall inherit the calamities described therein. This admonition is not about the literal alteration of scripture, as if the exact wording were the crux. Rather, it concerns the distortion and misinterpretation of the prophecies to fit personal agendas, and the imposition of conjectures unfounded by the scripture. Let us then cleave to the clear pronouncements of John and eschew all unfounded conjecture. When we delve into the prophetic passages of Revelation, we must adhere to the principle of letting the Bible interpret itself. It is imperative that we exercise caution and refrain from indulging in speculative interpretations that extend beyond what the prophecy has explicitly revealed. Attempting to align prophecy with contemporary events or sensationalizing for the sake of popular excitement leads to subjective conjecture. Such interpretations fail to fortify our faith in prophecy. Instead, they undermine our trust in its reliability. When approached with clarity and understanding, the prophecies contained within Revelation serve practical purposes. They instruct us on how to live faithfully in the present, while also preparing us for what lies ahead. Verily, the discernment of prophecy shall kindle a zeal within us to spread the good news. The revelation to John admonishes the faithful to beware the grandiose miracles and omens of the deceitful prophet. The miracles of the Messiah were acts of healing, exorcisms, nourishing multitudes, and stilling tempests. These deeds were not for spectacle but for salvation and rebirth. The Lord oft beseeched those cured to hold their tongues, for his desire was for repentance, not revelry born of marvels. Contrarywise, the mendacious prophet leads the flock astray with beguiling feats wrought by modernity's hand. Technological marvels, genetic ventures, celestial journeys, illusory media, and necromancy. The throngs are swayed not to him, but to the dragon's offspring, who reigns in silence and shadow. The adversary's herald bestows all glory upon the fiend's scion, for from him he derives his sign-working power. This false seer is naught but a vessel, a tool, a dutiful thrall. He is acutely aware that without the dragon, he is powerless. He yields to the seaborne beast, not in adoration or reverence, but in dread, employing him as a calculated means to an end. The followers of Islam, though they bow not to graven images, do prostrate towards the sacred Kaaba's ebony cornerstone in Mecca, up to 34 times each day. Throughout history, in regions conquered by Islam, those who do not willingly embrace Islam, be they unbelievers, animists, or idol worshippers, are deemed worthy of death or enslavement. Between 1562 and 1810 AD, over 40 million African individuals were forcibly sold into slavery in South, Middle, and North America often due to their refusal to accept Islam and their rejection of worshipping Allah in the direction of the Black Stone. The stark choice presented was worship or death, prostration to Allah or a lifetime of servitude, a grim reality enforced by Muhammad, deemed a false prophet by Christians. While Muslims assert Muhammad's prophethood, Christians maintain the opposite belief. A true prophet of God serves as the flawless mouthpiece of the Almighty, never faltering in conveying divine messages. Thus, when an individual claims divine instruction but propagates falsehoods, they speak presumptuously and cannot be regarded as a prophet of God. Did Muhammad make any false statements? Indeed, he did. And ultimately, he admits that Jesus warned us about the false prophet whose image will speak. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is already in the world. However, beloved, the culmination of all these false teachings will one day manifest in the ultimate false teacher who will serve the Antichrist. The Lord refers to this individual as the false prophet, the beast from the earth. It is noteworthy that various scholars have observed how the events of Bible prophecy tend to cast their shadows ahead. Therefore, as we draw nearer to the Lord's return, we will witness these conditions intensify as the world is being primed for the arrival of the Antichrist and his accomplice, the false prophet. And I beheld another beast rising out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb and speaking as a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, causing the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And he performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of men and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs that he was allowed to work in the presence of the beast, 
telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And he was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Jesus' warning in Matthew 7 bears resemblance to this, as ancient shepherds would wear woolen clothing obtained from their sheep. Jesus' analogy is clear. He warns of false prophets who will attempt to mimic true prophets. They will outwardly resemble pastors, speak as pastors, and claim to convey the word of God like pastors, yet they are agents of deceit. For such individuals are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as messengers of Christ. Indeed, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Hence, it is not surprising if his servants also masquerade as ministers of righteousness. Perhaps hailstorms and snowfalls are manifestations of God's displeasure directed towards Muslims. Despite Muslims' devotion to the Kaaba for prayer and pilgrimage, they appear to overlook God's warnings. God seeks to assert his authority and issue final admonitions. It appears that Muslims have embraced the teachings of the false prophet, much to God's dismay, much to God's dismay, much to God's dismay, much to God's